My friends, you are being ripped off every single day, and it is intentional. It is a black and white fact, and if you'll stick with me, I'll tell you how that is. My friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. It is Monday, September 5th. Oh my goodness, did I have another eventful weekend. As I mentioned in the opening, yes, we are all being ripped off. It actually infuriates me. I mean, it really does. It, I don't know that I know anything that makes me any madder than this that I'm about to tell you about. Some of you will just say, well, what's the big deal, you know? Uh, well, it's a big deal in my opinion. I mean, I really believe that it's intentional and I really believe it's costing consumers, not millions, billions of dollars, billions upon billions of dollars. And it's absolutely intentional in my opinion. Okay, so what am I griping about? You know, I always do my own work on cars and trucks if I can. I mean, there are some things that just don't make sense. But for the light average things, like changing your own oil, I mean, it's really not that hard. I know I know, 90% of the people out there watching this are not going to change their own oil. Okay, I get that. But it should be fairly easy to do, right? We started mass producing automobiles back around 1913, something like that's when Henry Ford created the first line. I mean, that's 109 years. And for 109 years, we could change our own oil, we could drain the radiator. Well, guess what? You can't do that stuff on a lot of cars anymore. A long time ago, I bought a uh, Plymouth Horizon. You had to take 18 screws and bolts out before you could even get to the oil drain. The next day after I changed the oil in that car, I took it to the dealer and traded it off. That's how bad I hated it. Well, I had a similar experience this weekend. Some of you will recall that I mentioned the turbo actuator has gone out of my 2013 Dodge Ram Cummings 6.7 diesel truck. It's a one ton truck, 3500 series. So the first thing they tell you to do when you have to change this actuator out is to drain the antifreeze. So I thought, well, that's usually pretty dang easy. It's kind of like the hose on your house. You just go over to the wall, you turn the thing like this, and the water starts coming out, right? It's that simple. It really is that simple on a car, too. You might have to lay on your back and, and crawl under there and see the little spigot, but you just turn it. It's a 30 second operation on a bad day. I mean, even if you don't know what you're doing, you can do it in 30 seconds. So I crawl under there thinking, all right, I'll uh, find that little, what they call a pet cock, and you just turn it, you know, like a couple of turns and the antifreeze starts flowing out. Oh, I crawl under there, I don't see anything to turn. There's nothing there. I look everywhere. I try to find some kind of creative other solution that might be there, and there's nothing there. And I go from the top, and I'm looking down, and I see nothing. Absolutely nothing. Or no hint of anything to drain the antifreeze out with. So I get on the internet, I start looking, and the professional mechanics. Now, I'm not kidding. These are professionals, and this is what's costing you the money. They take the whole grill off the truck. They take all these plastic parts off the truck. They take off all these other little paraphernalia parts off the truck to get to the petcock to turn it. That's an extra hour's labor just to do a 30 second operation. Now, you might think, well, I don't care. I don't want to do that myself anyway. But you do care because you just paid a full hour's labor for a mechanic to take that apart, to get in there so he can do a 30 second operation. A ten, it's not even 30 seconds, it's 10 seconds. You know, it's like that. It's just like turning the hose on on your, gar on your side of your house. It's no different than that. 
Yet, you got to take the grill off, you got to take all these other plastic parts off, and you got to take off a couple of other little brackets and things so you can reach your hand in there to turn this thing. Oh, that infuriates me. I mean, it infuriates me. I can't even tell you how mad that makes me. If the guy was here that designed that and was responsible for the design, not the little flunky guy that's on the computer that had to draw it out, not that guy, the guy that's responsible for that. If he was available and I was allowed to deal out the punishment for that, here's exactly how it would go. I'd say, okay, here's all the tools you need to drain the antifreeze. Now that's a 30 second operation. So I'm gonna give you a whole minute. That's twice as long as it should take. After that minute's up, I'm gonna take this hickory stick and I'm gonna swat you right across your rear end as hard as I can hit you. So every minute thereafter, I'm gonna hit you again. And let's just see how many hits it takes before you get that drained. And that's exactly how it would go if it was me doiling out the punishment for some idiot to design something like that. For a hundred years, we've been able to just reach under there and turn something and drain it. I even saw one guy on the internet said, oh, way, way to go, Chrysler, great design. And he actually took the radiator hose off on the bottom and drained it out the radiator hose. One guy is more like me. He, I saw what he did. He found a, a couple of components he could take off from the top side, then reach down through a tiny hole, and I'm not kidding when I say tiny, the hole's the size of your arm, it's like that big, and I'm not kidding. You reach down in there, and you can reach down to where the petcock is, and you can get a tool on it to turn it. Except here's the tool. I am not lying to you when I tell you, when you put this down in there, and, and this is, that is the petcock right there. You have to, first of all, you can't see it because you're reaching down through a tiny hole and there's stuff all over everything. You cannot see your hand. So you're doing this by feel. You gotta get this in there and, it, and that's hexagonal like this is. So you have to get it lined up and then you have to turn it. Now, the problem is if you reach in with your right hand, the tools on your left side here and you can't turn it anyway, Plus, the tool's angled this way, and that's the direction you need to turn it. Now it's already hitting something. So you have to reach in with your left hand. You have to put it in like this, and then that way the tool's leaning to the right, and then you can turn it a little bit to the left, but you can only turn it about, well, you can turn it, honestly, about that far. So then you have to take the tool out, reposition it, and turn it about that far again until you get this out. That should be the simplest thing to do. And of that whole project of changing out the actuator, that's the hardest thing to do. And it should be the easiest. It makes me so mad I can't even tell you. And then on top of that, look at this. This is a hexagonal nut. So you should be able to put a socket wrench on this, right? Wrong, because look what they did. They put this little lip on top of the nut See that little lip there? That means you can't get a socket on there. See that little little extra bump there? That way you cannot slide a socket on there. And if you could slide a socket on there, then you could just ratchet it, right? Oh, it's so frustrating. I figured out if I just took my power steering off on the top and reached down through that hole. Now you might say, well, the professional mechanics would do that too and they could do it much faster. No, they won't do that because it cuts your arm up, scratches your arm all to pieces. Look at the scratches I have on my arm here from that yesterday, reaching down in there. The professionals aren't gonna do that. They're not gonna cut themselves because they're on the clock. They don't care how much they're charging you. They're gonna go ahead and take off the grill. They're gonna do all that stuff just to get to the petcock so they can just do this by hand. I can't stand it. It drives me crazy. I wish I could dole out the punishment to that guy. I would love to do it. Okay, I'm off of it. It really burns my butt though. On the good side of the news, my pond's doing great. Here's a short video on that. This will give you an idea of how fast the spring is running because basically every drop of water that comes in is probably coming out at this point. So that's a pretty good amount of water that runs into the pond. And you can see then that it's carried away by this little ditch and it goes back down to the other creek that's in those trees there. And it's a pretty good sized creek. That creek never goes dry, and this would be one of the reasons. 
So here's what the pond looks like. Now we had a big rain yesterday. It was a pretty good solid rain all most of the day actually. So that's part of the reason the water's running over, but I don't really think the rain was enough to actually fill the pond. It was a nice slow solid rain, but it was a more like a sprinkle rain all day. So it wasn't like it was just going to flood the pond. So really happy with it. There's the pipe that goes into the water there. I might put a screen over that pipe just in case the water does come up that it doesn't, uh, you know, wash out the fish. So here's an actual view of the spring, a close up of the spring. And you can see an old pipe there. A lot of the water's coming out of the pipe. There's some more water coming out above the spring there. That pipe's pretty clogged. I tried to unclog it a little bit. And you can see it barely goes any distance now. And it's in the pond. <laughs> Where before, it went quite a ways. It was, it was way down there before it actually hit the pond before. About where those tall weeds are. So, the pond has expanded exponentially just in the last week and a half, two weeks. Well, hope you enjoyed another look at the pond. I am so tickled with the way it's turned out. I went back out there after I took that little video and I took a long pole and a hook and I pulled all the loose sticks and things, debris out of the pond that I could get out. And there's still a couple things that are still attached by the roots that I couldn't get out, but for the most part, it's all out of there now. It's all cleaned out, looks real nice. There's still a lot of weeds and things growing. And yeah, some of you will say you should have left that in there for habitat. Well, there's plenty of habitat with all the heavy weeds and things growing in there, so that's not an issue. And we are going to get a few more fish and stock it with a few more fish, even though there's quite a few fish in there. I, I can, you can see them because the water's so clear. My buddy Ron's coming out this morning and we're just going to take off and look around and he's, he hasn't seen the tower yet and he hasn't seen the pond and things like that. So we're just going to play around and take a look at some things. And then finally back to business on my video, recent video of working on the neck on that J Ford mandolin. Thank you for all the wonderful, nice comments. But there are a couple of comments that I did want to address and I thought I'd just address them here. Quite a few people said I should build a new neck for that and uh, just put a whole new neck on it. It'd be a lot faster, a lot cheaper. Well, all I can say is you don't understand that process if you think that's faster and cheaper. It's not faster and it's not cheaper. It would take at least three or four times as long and that's being conservative. It would probably take more like five or ten times as long. Uh, you know, so it's nowhere near faster or cheaper to make a whole new neck. And part of the problem is getting the neck out of the neck joint. On a mandolin, that's not easy. It's not easy on a guitar. It's really hard on a guitar. And it's ten times harder on a mandolin. Some people said, well, you know, uh, fellow up in Canada, he routes it out and puts a plug in there. You should have routed it out and put a plug in there. No. Been there, done that too, and what I did was the way to do it. I, I've only been doing this 40 years, so trust me, I know what I need to do and how to do it. And the only problem I have sometimes is what order should I do it in and uh, how far do I have to go? And that was the problem on this one. And, there, and I'm really glad I went the way I did because had I just routed it out and plugged it, I would have left a ton of sp loose splinters in there that would have just been loose and not glued to anything. You know, you know, when I sawed it straight off and all those little splinters came out of the peg head, but that wasn't because I sawed it off. It was because they were broke and splintered up into the peg head. By the fact that I did that and then could glue those splinters back, then when I sawed it off, everything was solid. So, you know, when I saw sawed my long angles. So I'm absolutely 100% happy I did it the way I did it. You know, routing it out and plugging it is an option in some cases, but I didn't feel like that was a good option in this case. 
That's about it. Uh, you will have to wait a while for part three to come out because Emery's going to have to get back to finish that. You know, she's out uh, at a horse show. Uh, and they're at the what they refer to as the World Championships of the Missouri Fox Trotting Horse Breed Association. They're down in Ava, Missouri for the whole week. So she won't even be back till next week. So unfortunately, it's going to be a little while before part three is done. I will just add the last thing is the comments from Dutch Miller were very nice. Uh, he's uh, really excited about his mandolin. He's got it back and he's jamming on it. And he made a couple of comments. On the first video, he had a really nice comment. And on the second video, he mentioned that I think he said something like he was really glad I convinced him that I could fix that because uh, he's really happy with it now. He's, he's one happy jammer. <laughs> so he's already got the mandolin back and been playing it for quite a while now. So these videos are always behind on things like that. So by the time you make your comment, usually the instruments are already back in the hands of the customer. <laughs> just so you understand that. Well, that's about it for today. Sorry I had to get on such a rant, but I'm telling you what, we're all being ripped off and it ain't right. It, we should be able to take those auto places to the court because we're, they're costing us billions that they don't need to charge for. I mean, it could have been so simple to just leave the, the uh, drain in the place it's always been on every engine for the last hundred years. But no, they couldn't do that. They had to intentionally put it someplace where you can't get to it. I said I was over it. I guess I am. I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>